inviting me to be here, Dr. Ferreras, Dr. Farr, and thank you all for coming here, especially on this rainy day. It's really nice to be back here on your wonderful campus again, so thank you, it's great. So, um, what I'd like to talk with you uh, about today, as you can see, is uniqueness and intrinsic value, and precisely uh, what I mean by that, I think, will become clear as I talk about it, but of course, as you heard, I'm a philosopher, so much of this is going to take place at a pretty conceptual level, so we're mostly talking about the concept of uniqueness and its relationship to value understood in a particular way, which I will illuminate as we go along. So the central question that I want to figure out is, what is uniqueness? What is it? And why does it matter? Because it sure seems to matter. So for example, in this picture here, it doesn't look like much, does it? But this happens to be the world's most unique stamp. This is the British Guyana one cent magenta. That's what it looks like close up. And it's sold at auction for over $9 million. Here's another stamp that you might have heard of. This is sort of more famous stamp. It's called the Inverted Jenny. So you can see what makes this stamp uh, particularly noteworthy is that the airplane is upside down. So there was one small section in this large run of stamps that was produced. Just a few of those stamps came out with this error in them where the, the airplane was inverted. But as a result, these stamps are very valuable. They're highly prized by collectors. Uh, I think the most recent one to be acquired went for something close to a quarter of a million dollars. So they're very, they're very expensive. Now, what seems to be happening in these cases is that uniqueness plays a role in imbuing something with value. Now, of course, this is just monetary value. But it seems that uniqueness enhances value more generally in many kinds of cases. So, for example, a Stradivarius violin, they're very rare, perhaps not utterly unique, but we think that they are very, very precious, perhaps a little bit because there are so few of them. If one were destroyed, for example, we would think that this would be a terrible tragedy. Now, of course, they are worth a lot of money, but the reason why, presumably, they're worth a lot of money is because there is something that is so special about them. Beyond things like this, you might also think, for example, if you're going to give somebody a present, that giving them a unique vase made by an artisan potter is a better present than just picking something off the shelf mass-produced from Ikea. You might also think that a perfectly good thing, in fact an excellent thing to do, perhaps on a rainy day like today, is to spend the afternoon at a museum. And part of the attraction there is that you can look at all sorts of things that you couldn't possibly see anywhere else. And that you would happily spend $5 or $10 or perhaps even more to make sure that you get a glimpse of a Tyrannosaurus rex skeleton or an ancient Egyptian sarcophagus. And part of the appeal and the value there is that these things are unique. And beyond this, you probably think that uniqueness matters for you and for the people that you love. And part of what it seems important about our lives together is that we cherish each other in a very distinctive and individual way. Each person is unique and special. We want to be distinctive, and that seems important to us. So these are the concepts that I want to explore. I want to figure out what it is for something to be unique and why it seems to have a relationship to value of a certain kind. Okay. <clears throat> so, when I talk about intrinsic value, now I've given some examples that, uh, that are just about monetary value, it's just how much something costs, that may or may not have a relationship to intrinsic value. But when we talk about intrinsic value, and perhaps some of you have heard about this in your philosophy classes, this is the value that something has for its own sake, as it were. And it's generally contrasted to mere instrumental value. In fact, money is the easiest kind of instrumental value to understand. 
So when you think about what's the what's value good, what's money good for? Well, it's good for buying lots of other things. It, it's not, it doesn't do you any good just sitting there, a big pile of money. It's only when you go and spend it on things that money makes any sense at all. So what, what I'm interested in now isn't the mere instrumental value of uniqueness, but I would like to explore whether or not it has a relationship to intrinsic value. That is to say, when something is good in itself, just considered by itself, so to speak, or the value that it has for its own sake, as opposed to the value that it has for some other end. So this is the target. What is the relationship between uniqueness and this kind of value, the value that something has strictly considered by itself for its own sake? Okay. So first, though, we need to understand what is uniqueness? What is it for something to be unique? Now, uh, if you're really persnickety about grammar, then you probably already know this one. That to be unique means to be one of a kind. That's why there's a grammatical error when you describe something as being very unique, because you can't be very one of a kind. It's one, it's singular. So it's, what this suggests is that to be unique is to be singular in a way. There's only one of them. And it's also kind relative. So there's one of a kind. Now, what beyond this, to be one of a kind, to be unique, means that the one is distinct or qualitatively dissimilar, has different qualities or properties from the other members of the kind. So if you consider, for example, the first slide that I had here, there were many green apples, there's one red apple, there's one kind there, that is to say apples, and there's one among that kind which has a different quality from the other apples there. It's red, the others are green. So it seems to be what we have in mind when we talk about uniqueness in the most sort of general, run-of-the-mill, common-sense way. It's also, and this is pretty important, uniqueness is related to rarity. So if there had been two green apples and a huge, two red apples and a sea of green apples, we would think that there is still something sort of significant about the two red apples and the sea of green apples. So similarly, uh, the inverted Jenny stamps that I that I illustrated a moment ago, there's more than one of those, but their rarity seems to augment their value. Likewise with Stradivarius violins or Tyrannosaurus rex skeletons, there are more than one of these, but the fact that there are so few of them seems to augment their significance. So rarity and uniqueness seem to have in common that they have a relationship with augmenting intrinsic value, or so it seems. Now given all that, you might wonder though, well, hey, wait a minute. Snowflakes have kind of become a running joke about uniqueness. And of course, but they sure seem to be unique. So one of the most dazzling facts that we learned about nature pretty early on is that every snowflake is different from every other snowflake. But surely we don't want to say that each individual snowflake is, has intrinsic value. If you've ever lived somewhere where you have to shovel your driveway in the winter, then you will really not think that this is an appealing position to hold. It's not, it's not the case that each snowflake is especially important, especially when you wish they would all melt and go away. So what this suggests, actually, in fact, I think, is that there's one more feature that we need to add to our account of what it is for something to be unique in the way that's relevant for value. And that's this. It's important that other members of the kind are relevantly similar to one another. So for the uniqueness of a thing to be significant for its value, it has to be the case not only that it's different from the other members of the kind, but also that many of the other members of the kind are somewhat similar to one another. There's a cluster of similarity. So snowflakes, each snowflake is somewhat different from every other snowflake. There's no cluster of similarity where most snowflakes are almost the same as every other snowflake. Uh, in contrast to apples, there's only one red apple and most of the other, if not all of the other apples in that picture are green. So that seems to be the pattern that matters for uniqueness to have a value. <clears throat> okay. Now, even then, you might be suspicious that this pattern, just by itself, should matter for value. So consider a toothbrush factory. 
So suppose there's a malfunction in the toothbrush factory. And one of the toothbrush, toothbrushes comes out with two heads. Two-headed toothbrush. It's unique. None of the other toothbrushes have two heads. Now, unlike, for example, the inverted Jenny stamps with the inverted airplane, I don't think that we would really suddenly now think, oh wow, this toothbrush is so valuable. We should like put it in a museum and auction it off for thousands of dollars. I mean, maybe some people are excited about that, but it seems the opposite would be true. In fact, we probably, you know, if we were working in this factory, we would throw it away, quality control, and uh, you know, look for the uniform toothbrushes. So what this suggests is that simply being different from the other members of the kind. In other words, just being unique in the way that we've just described it doesn't by itself imbue anything with intrinsic value. There needs to be more going on. In fact, you can even think back to those apples. So there are some, there's a red apple and a bunch of green apples. They're still just apples. OK, so this means perhaps that uniqueness, uh, uh, right, so some philosophers have considered this, and what they thought what we should conclude is that when uniqueness matters, it only matters for things that already have some prior intrinsic value. This is why, say, um, a Stradivarius violin, its value is increased just because it is so rare. Because it was already a very old violin, and the fact that it's a Stradivarius violin seems to heighten preciousness. Or, for example, consider other like uh, paintings by Picasso. There's only one of them left in the whole world, just suppose that were the case. It would be all the more precious because it would be unique, but paintings by Picasso are already intrinsically valuable. So that's what explains why the toothbrush that's unique doesn't have any intrinsic value. Because perhaps it's the case that uniqueness only augments prior intrinsic value. It doesn't imbue it to something that had no and yet, what about these stamps? Do stamps have intrinsic value? Hmm, no, in fact, they seem to be like the very hallmark of the kind of thing that only has mere instrumental and not intrinsic value. Just like money. Stamps are only good because you can put them on an envelope and send the envelope somewhere. The stamp just by itself doesn't seem to have any intrinsic value. But these stamps did seem to acquire some additional value in virtue strictly of their uniqueness. So this does seem to provide some support to the position that simply being unique enhances a thing or can imbue a thing with intrinsic value, even if it wasn't there before. But if that's true, that's going to commit us to saying that this two-headed toothbrush also has intrinsic value. And that seems clearly ridiculous. So we're caught between these two seemingly uh, appealing positions, the ridiculousness of the value of the toothbrush, but the seeming plausibility that the stamp has some value. So this puts a little pressure on the, on the idea, again, that uniqueness enhances intrinsic value. Okay. Since stamps don't have any intrinsic value before they are unique. Now, on the other hand, there is support coming from a completely different angle for the idea that uniqueness can enhance value. So suppose for a moment that you have just bought a new house in the suburbs, and like many suburban neighborhoods, almost all the houses in your neighborhood look virtually identical to one another. So you might think a way that you can sort of make your house more special, more valuable to you, is by making it unique in some way. <coughs> by planting for an interesting garden, or by painting your garage a really appealing color, uh, or maybe you know, adding to the landscape or something like that. Um, so it seems that we have some reason to make our house unique in this way, and that seems to augment its significance to us. Um, so you might think, well, that does seem to be a case where uniqueness enhances the value of something. Now, so this might reinforce, once again, the position that uniqueness can enhance intrinsic value. And yet, and this will be a helpful point for something I'm going to say later on, 
Once we start to think about this carefully, it doesn't seem to be the uniqueness per se, the uniqueness itself, that has this role with respect to value. Rather, uniqueness seems to be a byproduct, as it were, of the things that really matter in making the house distinctive. So to see that this is the case, so suppose your next door neighbor came over to your house and, and just painted your garage for you and decided to paint it purple with pink polka dots. Now your house is unique. <laughs> now, surely though you would not be happy about this. Well, maybe you would if that suits your taste, but it seems more likely than not it really matters to you that you have a say in how your house looks. In fact, that seems to be the whole point of personalizing it in a way for you. It now becomes yours in a way, perhaps an expression of your good taste or your creativity or something like that. In other words, it's not, you don't want it simply to be the case that your house is different from all the other houses. It matters a great deal in precisely what way it's different. And in fact, the difference the difference is a sort of offshoot or byproduct of the thing that really matters to you, and that's self-expression or something like that, or creativity, or your skills at gardening, or your good taste in garage paint colors. <clears throat> so even though this seems like a natural thought, that uniqueness is relevant for making, say, enhancing the value of the things that belong to us when we personalize things, on closer inspection, it's not the uniqueness itself that adds to the value. Rather, it's the creativity, the self-expression, or other things like that. Those things are what matter and are valuable. And the uniqueness is simply a sign or an indication that uh, those things are present there. So again, it seems like uniqueness, in the way that we've described it, as being qualitatively dissimilar from other members of the kind, perhaps doesn't play the role in augmenting value in the way that it first seemed. And yet, consider again all of these other cases where it really does seem very appealing. Stradivarius violins do seem all the more precious and interesting just because they're different from other violins. And uh, perhaps you recognize this uh, because you're a fan of the Houston Museum of Natural Science where it's, it seems like a perfectly good use of your time is to look at the dinosaur skeletons because you can't really see one of those every day and they seem to be worth it just because there's nothing quite like that anywhere else. So uniqueness here does seem to be important. It seems to enhance or augment the significance of all of these things. Okay. So here's what I'd like to look at. The kind of uniqueness that we've been considering so far, uniqueness where something is dissimilar from other similar members of the kind, isn't in fact relevant for value. There's another kind of uniqueness. Call it type two uniqueness. It's not the uniqueness of one of a kind, but it's more like the uniqueness of being the one and only. An object is type two unique if it has properties that can't be newly instantiated in other objects. Okay, so what do I mean by that? What I mean is that it's not the difference that makes something significant. It's the way that it's different. That's significant. So things like dinosaur bones and Stradivarius violins, or perhaps pottery made by an artisan potter, have properties or features that other things simply can't have. They're the only things that have those properties. The pots that are made by that artisan potter are the only pots that have the property of being made by that artisan potter. Stradivarius violins are the only violins that have the property of being a violin made by Antonio Stradivari. And in fact, no other violin in the future could ever have that property. In other words, it can't be instantiated in any future violin. Why? Because, well, Antonio Stradivari lived about 300 years ago and is now dead, so we can't make any more violins. Likewise, all the dinosaur bones that currently exist, that's it! No future bones could be dinosaur bones. Okay, cloning could happen, but just in case it doesn't happen, these are the only dinosaur bones that will ever be dinosaur bones. The property, being a dinosaur bone, can't ever be newly instantiated in some to-be-created object. So I think this pattern seems significant in some way. But you might think, wait a minute, isn't this 
totally ubiquitous, or at least uh, irrelevant. After all, the two-headed toothbrush, we might think, is the only toothbrush that's ever going to have two heads. And we already realized that that was ridiculous and did not enhance its value. That seems true. Moreover, there's this totally boring sense in which absolutely everything is the only thing that will ever have the properties that it has. It's actually kind of a fascinating point when you think about it, but uh, it doesn't seem to make every precious thing a precious thing. We sort of lose track of what it is that we're looking for if we suddenly start to you know, be fascinated by every speck of dirt. Okay. So, this means there's more to be said. So here's what I'm going to propose. Type 2 uniqueness is relevant for value when it's the valuable properties that are unreinstantiable. So type 2 uniqueness is a way for value to be unique. So here's what I mean by that. The properties that make dinosaur bones important and valuable and worth preserving are the very properties that couldn't possibly be instantiated by other things, namely the properties of being a dinosaur bone. The property of being a violin made by Antonio Stradivari is the very thing that makes that violin significant and important and worth preserving and listening to. And that's the very property that couldn't possibly be reinstantiated in any new violin. The property of being a two-headed toothbrush well, perhaps it's the case that that could never be reinstantiated in that particular way by any future toothbrush. Doesn't make the toothbrush valuable. That was the counter example. That's not a good making property. But the properties of being a dinosaur bone, being a Stradivarius violin, being made by this particular talented potter, these are all what we're called good making properties. They are the very features in virtue of which those objects seem significant. And as it happens, those properties can be instantiated anew in anything else. So this, I think, is a better way of understanding what uniqueness is when it matters for value. So it's not simply being different from the other members of the kind, but it's that the difference of the thing is a valuable and important difference. So in other words, it's not simply being different that's relevant for uniqueness or for value, Rather, it matters that the difference itself is valuable. Okay. So, at this point, though, you're probably wondering, what about me? <laughs> what about people? Now, when you think about it, though, of course, we're all unique. And it becomes kind of a joke, but it's also not a joke. Indeed, it's the case that while each of us is distinctive from everybody else, of course this pattern, and this is now a joke in popular discourse, it's more, it becomes more of the pattern of snowflakes. Each one of us is somewhat different from everybody else. And as we've already acknowledged, that fact doesn't seem to be relevant just by itself for value. Now there might be other extrinsic reasons why differences among people are very significant. But if we're thinking about the other way in which human beings' uniqueness matters to us, in the way that we want our loved ones to appreciate us, in the way that we appreciate our loved ones, it's not clear that just being distinctive from others does the trick. So the snowflake pattern doesn't seem relevant. Uh, so how can we understand this? So you might think at first that maybe this is where type 1 uniqueness comes back into play. So it, it's a tempting thought. Sometimes I think, uh, you know, when we're sort of doing some soul searching, we want to know what makes us stand out in a crowd. What makes us the red apple among the green apples? Now that can be valuable. That can be important. But it sort of depends on the context. And in fact, as we've already acknowledged, once we pe peel back the layers of when uniqueness matters, I think we will see that for people, it's also, it matters the way that you're unique. So say, for example, you think you're, <laughs> you're, the way that you decide to become unique is to have a, a unique hairstyle. Um, now, it probably matters to you what your hairstyle is. You wouldn't, after all, 
just want to wake up one morning and find out that you know your brother or something has given you a mohawk like this fellow here. That it's like your neighbor coming and painting your garage purple with pink polka dots. Rather, you want to stand out in a crowd, presumably, because it's important to you to hold on to your own individuality, your creativity, say something about yourself, your good taste, your creativity with hairstyles. So it seems that while type one uniqueness can sometimes play a role for us, it's not the uniqueness per se that is relevant for our value, how we think of ourselves as valuable. It's rather the uniqueness, just like it was in the case of the houses, is an offshoot or a byproduct of what really matters, which is something like creativity or self-expression, something like that. That seems more important. So, okay, what about type two uniqueness then? So type two uniqueness says that what matters for value and for uniqueness is that uh, a thing, in this case, you, have good making properties, properties that make you valuable, and those properties couldn't be had by others, and, and they're part of your good making properties. So okay, that all sounds very abstract, but this might pan out something like, uh, like for example, having talents that pe other people couldn't possibly have. Or perhaps an arrange, a range of talents, a cluster of talents, like drinking coffee and riding a unicycle at the same time. So it may be that nobody except this person can do that. And in virtue of that, this person has type 2 uniqueness. Now I think, as ridiculous as this example may be, I think that this is certainly true of us and of the people that we love. That there's some cluster of features that each one of us has that couldn't possibly be had by anybody else, and they do make us distinctive and distinctively valuable in this way. Optimists like to say about people, everyone has something to bring to the table, everyone's got some valuable contribution to make. So I think that this is an important thing to acknowledge about the relationship between uniqueness and value and people. However, I don't think that we should stop there. That can't possibly be all there is to say about how our uniqueness as human beings matters. But the reason why type 2 uniqueness can't be the whole story is because even talentless, boring people matter. That was supposed to be funny. <laughs> I hope you're not thinking they do. <laughs> they do. So even people who don't have some uh, unique cluster of talents that nobody else could possibly have, that people like that still matter. It doesn't, it's not, your value as a person isn't just a matter of how uniquely good you are at playing the flute or riding the unicycle or having interesting philosophical insights. There are lots of people, after all, that do all of these things. And it doesn't seem like that's all there is for the value of each individual human being. So and I should say, even if there are no talentless, boring people in the world, suppose there were, we would still think that they matter too. And it would be a tragedy if they died. So their value as a human being is still there. It's not simply wrapped up in their talents. OK. Uh, perhaps I will mention this conceptual point. So another important distinction, so it's subtle but seems relevant, type 2 uniqueness, notice, the properties that are relevant for type 2 uniqueness are merely contingent. By that I mean it's just a matter of historical fact. It's a sort of accident, as it were, that dinosaurs went extinct, for example. So it's not a necessary fact. It's not a, it's not a deep conceptual necessity that dinosaur bones are the only things that could ever have these properties. I kind of made a joke about if they were cloned again, then there would be more dinosaur bones. It's just a contingent fact that they have their good-making properties in this irreplaceable way. But for people, our unique value, the unique value that each and every one of us has, doesn't seem to be contingent. So it's even if you were cloned, say, uh, and your 
phone were standing here right next to you, or perhaps one of you has a twin, um, it doesn't take away from your value. <laughs> Twins matter too. Each one matters just as much as the other one. So it seems to be something that's deeper and more conceptual. In fact, it's a necessary fact, not a merely contingent fact, that whatever the good-making properties are of each individual, each individual human being, uh, those are necessarily attached to them. They're not merely contingently valuable in this way. So that's your uh, conceptual point there. So I want to conclude from this that the unique value of person isn't a matter of type 1 and isn't a matter of type 2 uniqueness. Although if I've acknowledged both of those can play a role in what we value about each other and what really is valuable about us, it doesn't exhaust all there is to the unique value of persons. What this suggests is that there must be a type 3 uniqueness. And now since I'm out of time, <laughs> I don't really have <laughs> much room to say much more about what is perhaps the most mysterious and perhaps the most important kind of uniqueness, but I'll leave on this perplexing note about it. Interestingly, it's possible that what grounds the unique value of each individual person is in fact the very same thing. It might be in virtue of our sameness that we have unique value as individuals. There's something deeply important about being a human being the very thing that we all have in common, that makes each distinctive, individual, unique human life important. Um, but of course, I can't say more now, but we have time for questions, and so I'll end there. Thank you.